How loud is loud? Hey Crash, today we're going to learn about the loudest sound ever recorded by humans. Actually, you might be surprised to know that I'm a goddamn genius when it comes to loud noises. I have no problem believing that. After all, you're an expert on bad smells and being obnoxious. But I'm not talking about your personal efforts in the field of loud noises. I want to discuss really loud noises. Alright, I guess it can't hurt to hear you out. <laughs> not as long as I'm speaking at 60 decibels. It'll make sense at the end of the video, trust me. I'm already fucking regretting this. Before we jump into discussing the loudest noise ever, we have to understand what a sound really is. Sound is a pressure wave caused by vibrating an object. Whether it be a tuning fork, a string, or even vocal cords, anything can produce sound. These vibrations cause the neighboring air particles to vibrate as well, transferring energy through different mediums. Imagine each particle bumping into the particle next to it, and so on. That's why there's no sound in space. Space is a vacuum, and therefore there's nothing to carry the sound waves. That's also why you can't surf in space, right? Alright, to start with, sound is an example of a longitudinal wave. The wave vibrates back and forth in the direction of motion. This lies in contrast to transverse waves, which vibrate perpendicular to the direction of motion, such as waves in the sea. But I'd have to say the main reason you can't surf in space is that there's, you know, no water. I was kidding. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Yeah, sure you were, Crash. But how are we capable of interpreting the sound waves? Big surprise, we use our ears. Okay, you probably already knew that. I mean, come on, even Crash knew that. Oh, you cheeky bitch. But let's get more specific. The ear is composed of three sections, each responsible for the conversion of sound into a signal that our brains can comprehend. The outer ear carries and amplifies the pressure wave of sound from the external environment into the working parts of the ear. The pinna, also known as the auricle, or the floppy thing on the side of your head, is designed to catch sound and send it down the ear canal. The ear canal is a tube about 2 centimeters long leading into the middle ear. This whole structure provides protection to more sensitive structures through use of earwax, or cerumen, which lubricates surrounding skin and stops harmful pathogens entering the ear. Or you can use the wax to make sculptures, like me. Oh, jeez. Is it... is it melting? I think it's melting. Yeah, that, uh, that happens every now and then. Uh, keep going while I fix it up a bit. Ugh. The middle ear is where things start getting interesting. A tightly stretched membrane, known as the tympanic membrane, or eardrum, is hit by the pressure wave of sound. A compression causes the drum to stretch inward, and a rarefaction causes the drum to stretch outward. In this way, the eardrum is vibrated at the same frequency as the sound wave. A tiny bone, known as the hammer, is attached to the inside of the eardrum, and its movements cause subsequent movements of the anvil and stirrup bones. And no, I'm not making these names up. The stirrup itself passes on its movements to cause a compression wave in the fluid of the inner ear. Furthermore, since the wave is passed from the large surface area of the eardrum to the small area of effect of the stirrup, the resulting signal is 15 times larger than the received signal. That's why we're able to hear such quiet sounds, like Crash sneaking out of his room for a midnight snack. Actually, no, that's also so I can work on my wax sculptures. They're surprisingly time-consuming now that I think about it. The inner ear has components for both interpreting sound and for maintaining belts. The cochlea, a snail-shaped organ, is filled with fluid and lined with small hair-like nerve cells. Each nerve cell is unique with varying lengths and differing ability to resist the liquid flowing over them. As the compression wave caused by the stirrup hits them, certain nerve cells will resonate more strongly if their specificity matches that of the wave's frequency. Our brain then interprets these signals as a culmination of each nerve's response, and, through the magic of neuroscience, we can identify sounds. Presumably, like any other sense, we have sense memory, and the specific activation of the hair-like nerve cells recalls this memory. Can we please stop with the biology bullshit? Sure, we can talk about physics instead. Huh, now I understand the phrase, be careful what you wish for. Jesus Christ. Sorry, Crash, but it's necessary to understanding how loud a noise is. We have two main ways of classifying a sound wave, by its frequency and by its amplitude. Frequency is a measure of how often a particle in the medium vibrates back and forth per unit time. For example, it could be one vibration per second, or, as this unit is more commonly known, one hertz. Humans can hear between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz, and we refer to frequencies below 20 hertz as infrasound, and above 20,000 hertz as ultrasound. Other animals, however, can hear outside this range. For example, dolphins can hear frequencies up to 200,000 hertz, whilst elephants can hear frequencies as low as 5 hertz. Hey, culture! What did the elephant say to a naked man? Ugh, I don't know. What did he say? That's cute, but can you breathe through it? 
Oh god, I'm so lonely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was pretty good actually. When we interpret frequency of a sound wave, we refer to the pitch of the sound. That is to say, a higher pitch has a higher frequency. So where does this factor into, for example, music? Well, sound waves of different frequencies that sound pleasant when played together are said to be consonant. An octave is one such example, where the frequencies of the two sounds are in a 2 to 1 ratio. Middle C, or C4, is 256 Hz, whereas C5 is 512 Hz. Separated by an octave, the two sounds played together sound nice. But frequency has nothing to do with volume. For that, we need to understand amplitude. Amplitude, or intensity, is a measure of the energy which a wave possesses. We tend to think of intensity as energy per time per area squared. But since energy per time is equivalent to power, we can instead use units of power. For example, a unit of intensity would be watts per meter squared. Through experimentation, we know that the threshold of hearing, the lowest noise the human ear can detect, is about 10 to the power of negative 12 watts per meter squared. To put that in perspective, this intensity would only displace particles of air by one billionth of a centimeter. And our ear can sense that. Are you getting this? Oh, I understand it. I just don't get as excited about facts as you do. Come on, Crash. I pretended your joke was funny. The least you can do is pretend to be interested. Oh, shut your noise hole. We both know you love that joke. Damn it. You know me too well. Anyway, the point is that our range of hearing is incredibly large, and hence deals with very large and very small numbers. For ease of use when talking about such numbers, we invented a logarithmic scale, which measures intensity in units of decibels. In case you have no idea what that means, essentially the units of this new scale are based on powers of 10. In case you still don't know what that means, well, just stick around. We begin by defining the threshold of hearing as being 0 decibels. A sound 10 times more intense than that would be 10 to the power of negative 11 watts per meter squared, or 10 decibels. A sound 10 times more intense than this new value would be 20 decibels, and so on. Yep, still not getting it. Try giving some examples. Well, the background hum of a refrigerator sits at 40 decibels. Normal conversation is about 60 decibels, whereas shouting is more like 100 decibels. A rock concert gets up to 110 decibels. That's one-tenth of the ear's pain threshold at 120 decibels. Whoa, wait, pain threshold? Sound can hurt you? Well, yeah. I mean, think of it as a defense mechanism so you know when you're approaching volumes able to burst your eardrum. Okay, why the hell didn't you lead this episode with this? How much does it take to instantly perforate an eardrum? Uh, given your enthusiasm, I'm not sure I should tell you this, but it's about 160 decibels, which is 100 times louder than a gunshot, but 100 times quieter than a rocket launch. But please, don't try replicating that sort of sound. Issues with any part of the delicate hearing machinery can cause hearing loss. If an incredibly loud noise occurs over just a short time frame, the eardrum can burst, or the small bones of the inner ear can fracture. But noise-induced hearing loss, or NIHL, can be even more subtle. Studies have shown that long-term exposure to noises above just 85 decibels, the volume of heavy city traffic for example, can damage the hair-like nerve cells in the cochlea. Unlike birds and amphibians, our hairs don't grow back, and hence we suffer permanent hearing loss. Meaning, what exactly? Obvious symptoms are a reduced ability to hear things such as normal conversation, or having to turn the TV up to hear it properly. Tinnitus, a ringing in the ears, can also indicate that you've been receiving too much oral stimuli. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Oral, not oral. Essentially, try to avoid noises that are too loud, too close, or too strong. It's much funnier the way I heard it. There are, of course, many other ways to lose your hearing. A person may have been born without hearing due to genetic factors. For example, the structures in the ear could be malformed, preventing proper signal transduction such as the case in conditions like trisomy 13S and osteogenesis imperfecta. Prenatal exposure to disease can also cause deafness, including rubella, influenza, and mumps. Come on already, stop stalling. What's the loudest sound? It's worth mentioning that mere intensity is not the only determinant in how loud something is. Loud is a subjective notion, meaning some people may perceive sounds as louder than other people. Older people, for example, usually have some hearing loss, and hence things are not as loud to them despite the sound having objectively the same intensity. This is due to natural degradation of their hair-like nerve cells. Yeah, obviously. Now out with it! Well, let me start by saying that we're talking about the largest recorded sound. I'm sure there are plenty of much louder things out there, but we'd be here all day if we listed them. The loudest recorded sound which has the largest consensus in the scientific community is the eruption of Mount Krakatoa on August 27th, 1883. The sound was actually recorded almost 3,600 kilometres, or 2,233 miles away, in Alice Springs, Australia. 
The shock wave, or pressure wave, from this explosion was even detectable in England, showing the magnitude of the blast as Krakatoa exploded into pieces. The sound clocked in at 180 decibels. And I don't mean at the site of the eruption. I mean 180 decibels in Alice Springs. Whoa, wait up. I heard the loudest event was the Tunguska or something. Some reports say that the Tunguska meteor, a 30 megaton mid-air asteroid explosion in the area of Podkamenia Tunguska in 1908, rated as high as 310 decibels. However, this rating isn't officially measured. Still though, that event in itself is amazing. We don't have enough time to go into it here, but go look it up yourself if you have the time. You had me at 30 megaton mid-air asteroid explosion. Another recorded sound worth mentioning is that of the sperm whale. The click of a sperm whale is 200 decibels, allowing it to communicate with other whales over vast distances. In fairness though, that's 200 decibels in water, but due to the different densities between air and water, it's really more like 173 decibels in air. I'd say that's still pretty impressive though. Awesome shit! Well, I'd love to stick around and help you wrap up this episode, but my lady awaits me. I'm gonna pretend I didn't hear that. Follow Culture Crush on social media! Like and subscribe for more! If you would like to support the show, then head on over to the Culture Crash Patreon page where you can receive rewards for your support. Every bit counts.